Well, hey CrossCart fans, I decided to shoot an entire video on the components and how I built the 100, 100 horsepower CrossCart. Now, first I'll talk about the frame. The frame is my own design and it took three attempts to get where we are. This frame is modular. Uh, you can mount any engine you want. You can use a variety of components. Uh, you can use different seats and a lot of these have been built by the very viewers of this channel and they all look amazing there's been snowmobile engines atv engines uh, tons of crotch rocket engines this one specifically uses a yzf 600 r engine which is a crotch rocket and the engine itself is tuned for a mid-range torque uh, I chose that because of the off-road nature of this. Um, I may not be up at the top part of the RPMs all the time, so I wanted that the, as much low-end grunt as I could get. It is a carbureted engine. Uh, it takes a cable clutch. Uh, initially, I converted the clutch to a hydraulic slave cylinder but I ended up changing it back to a cable clutch because it works better so let's dig into some of the components uh, first of all how much is this gonna cost that's gonna be the first question that always pops up how much does this cost that's an incredibly tough question to answer because it depends on your donor If you get a twenty thousand dollar crotch rocket and use it as a donor for this it's gonna cost you at least twenty thousand dollars so point blank, I built this for around $4,200. I got really lucky on a donor and went with it, and it's turned out really great so far. To make a roller, depending on if you use an ATV or if you use a crotch rocket, is going to cost you around $3,000. The metal for the frame uh, is around $1,000. Uh, I bought this when metal prices were still a little low, so... All the metal for me costs around 800 bucks. Yeah, prices have gone up a little bit. Um, the steering components, I use a 14 inch steering rack that's made for a Volkswagen dune buggy. And I customize the end links so that I can essentially eliminate bump steer. Uh, the front A-arms and hubs, I use them off of an ATV. These are off a Yamaha Raptor 660 and when you get this it's about 250 bucks for a full front end uh, you get the hubs you get the brakes you get the a arms you get the tie rods you get everything you need to basically mount a front end and that's why I did it 250 bucks for a front end is sick um, my favorite to use is Polaris Outlaw 525 or 500 or a Polaris Predator 500 uh, it's got bigger bearings and I like that. The bearings on these 660 arms are a little bit small, but they work. These parts only weigh maybe 100, 200 pounds more than an ATV. So all the components work out really well, including the shocks. Uh, I just run down the preload as much as I can. Uh, wheels and tires, I have Hoosier cross cart racing tires. These suckers are soft. They grip everywhere and I love them. And I just mounted them on the stock ATV wheels. So you can save a ton of money uh, getting used ATV parts, including the wheels. Uh, the fronts are a four by 156 bolt pattern, which is pretty common for any kind of wheels. These are DWT aluminum rims. Now, as far as controls, I use um, a, a inexpensive racing seat but quality nrg makes racing seats for drift cars when i built this these seats were about 200 bucks now they've gone up in price probably because all you guys are buying them because you see that i'm using them uh, a good quality racing seat is kind of important it smooths out the bumps it keeps you locked in because you're going to pull some lateral g's you're going to be jumping all that's important so on to the controls I've got a main battery switch. I've got a front and rear brake bias controller. So if I'm going from dirt to asphalt, uh, I can switch the brakes on the fly from 50-50 to 80-20. However I want to do it, whatever makes it drive better. As far as that goes, I use a Tilton 
racing pedal setup. Now this pedal sets about 400 bucks, but it is the expensive, but most worth it part of this build. Having fully adjustable racing pedals will make this, make your cart drive and feel so much better. Uh, you can adjust where the pedals sit to your liking. Uh, you're not going to overstroke your clutch because your clutch pedal is adjustable. You get the brake bias controller on your brake for your front and rear brakes. And you're not going to break any throttle cables because you have a forward and fully depressed stop. So 400 bucks, well worth it if you step it up to that. And you can go, like I said, you can go from dirt to street with your brake bias controller. Now, as far as your computer, I use a Trailtech Vapor. Now, I, I, I maybe should have used the stock cluster from the bike because the tack on this maxes out at 12. So it's not reading the full RPM of the motor. And I got this because I wanted an accurate speedometer reading that I could program for whatever tires I'm running. When I'm running a 26 inch tire, I can go in here and set the speed to be accurate for that size tire. If I'm running my 18 and a half inch cross cart tires, I can tune it so I know what speeds I'm doing. Uh, I hooked up the neutral light on it. If you put it in gear, it goes away. Uh, I've got my oil temperature warning light from the factory harness and my lights when they're on. I've got an indicator for that. These are awesome setups, but they're geared more towards ATVs than motorcycles. Uh, I use the stock key from the bike. I've got the start switch on a button, just like the bike. And I set up a neutral start override. Most bikes, if it's in gear and you're not pulling the clutch, this button won't work. So get nothing, which is exactly how I want it. Um, if I flip this up, as long as you're pushing the clutch, you can start it so you don't have to try to find neutral. Although neutral is very easy to find on this. Uh, I've got my lights on a switch and you're probably wondering what the weapon system is. Uh, I set up a Nerf gun on this, and this switch armed the system, and then this was the trigger to actually start shooting the Nerf gun. I thought it would be pretty fun to have a couple cross cards with guns on them and play tag or, you know, something stupid. Just now, as far as the shift linkage, uh, the bike I used is a sequential shifter, and as you know, it's on your left foot. So one down, five up. So this is the same pattern, but it's one forward and five back with neutral being between first and second. Uh, I put it on a hand shift because I like rally racing and rally cars. <laughs> and it is an absolute riot to drive. And also having a sequential shifter makes braking incredible. On an H pattern, you can't shift gears enough to get a lot of that engine braking. You get a lot more out of your foot braking, but on a sequential, you're just downshifting and using all of that engine to help slow you down. And on an asphalt track specifically, it's stellar. Uh, it works just as well as pushing the brakes with your feet. Uh, I did put an e-brake in here, but I don't use it a whole lot. Uh, if I was on a tighter track or wanted to show off or do something stupid, it, it's there for it and it makes the rear brakes a two two part system uh, i run it from the master cylinder to the pass through on the emergency brake and then a second line back to the rear brake now let's talk rear end this is a huge question i get because this is the trickiest part of the puzzle how do you run two wheels independent suspension from a crotch rocket engine well the polaris outlaw 500 and polaris outlaw 525 atvs uh, run a center spool if you've seen in my previous videos it's an engineering marvel uh, you have your brake set right on it you've got your sprocket on the other side and the inside of this is splined with bearings and basically cvs so your pivot point is very much centered, which is hard to do. 
So I took this, I found the same spline axle. Uh, Summers Brothers makes them. It's a plus six inch axle for a Polaris Razor 800, but it's the front end. The splines match the Polaris Outlaws. The A-arms uh, I designed myself. They're part of the plan. So the chassis and the A-arms all can be built from the plans and you can adapt the same components I use. The rear hubs are Polaris Outlaw 500 or 525. They're the same. And the rear shocks are also from a Polaris Outlaw 500 or 525 but you can also use Predator stuff. Uh, these are basically front shocks. The spring rates are about 120 pounds per inch. This moment on, <laughs> or for a while now, I'm gonna use my own rear carrier. Uh, I've been designing and building my own rear center section that uses Miata axles. These are awesome and once you build them, they last for a long time, but they do need rebuilt. They do need greased. Uh, the boots can sometimes tear and you'll have to replace those. Miata axles are bolt on and they're a hundred bucks a pair. So it makes it super easy. All my carts after this will be built with my own rear carrier. Uh, I do have the factory muffler on the YZF 600 R, uh, because I have neighbors, but when I take it to a racetrack, I'll just pull it off and make a little more noise. Uh, the wing is just basically for looks. Uh, I'm sure going 100 miles an hour, it helps keep the rear end planted a little bit, but just for everyday driving, it's, it's just for looks. I like the look of a cool wing on a cross cart. Uh, and this is just Amazon. Uh, I did get the extended risers to make it stick off a little bit, get that rocket bunny look. <laughs> Uh, the sway bar on it is from a utility ATV. I believe it's a Yamaha Big Bear. It's only like 15 bucks. It's got rubber bushings, and I just mounted to the chassis and use reuse the same end links that come on the Polaris Outlaws. It works out really well. Uh, I would not advise running a cart without a sway bar. It makes driving so much better, the drifting safer, and it's not going to want to roll at all. The radiator is an upgraded dual core aluminum radiator for the YZF 600R. I take the stock radiators and just adapt them to the chassis. Now, a lot of you say that the radiator, if it pops, it's going to leak all over the driver, but there is plenty of gap between the radiator and the driver. If it pops, it's going to go straight down into the engine bay. And I put a nice firewall here so that doesn't happen. Uh, if there's any kind of spray, it'll be a mist, which doesn't burn as much as just having it dripped all over you. Anti-hooking protection or Nerf bars. In the racing world, these are called anti-hooking. These are essentially open wheel carts. So if you get wheel to wheel with somebody and you get hooked up, it can launch you to the sky. So these carts are built to an FIA regulation for racing. Uh, this is a type of racing that's had zero casualties. So I figured when I was building this, I would adhere to the race regulations of a very, very safe racing series. And these are part of it. If you're going to race these with other people, I highly advise using these. They're in the plans. Uh, you can set the height for whatever ride height or wheel size you're using. Uh, I did put mirrors on it. It's got an aluminum floor pan on it and the regulations state that you have to have two millimeter thick aluminum or one millimeter thick steel so i use two millimeter for the floor pan i use two millimeter for the doors and the rear but i use thinner stuff so that i can help bend it around these curves to give it that cool look uh two millimeter for the hood as well uh, it's removable with four bolts so you can get to your electronics, uh, your pedal settings, your rack and pinion steering. Uh, I put a little eyebrow on here just because it looks cool. It looks cool without it. And I have one millimeter thick roof that is welded on in 20 places as the rules state. Questions about it being small. 
this looks incredibly small. I agree with you that it looks very, very small. Now I'm 5'11", 5'11 and a half, right, right at that normal guy mark. I'll hop in here and show you how well I fit. Now these racing seats, uh, I get them to sit pretty low, but there's no forward and aft adjustment. If you put sliders in there, it's gonna raise it up two inches, but you'll see that there's plenty of room. They're not too hard to get in and out of. So you can see I'm comfortably in here. Even with a helmet on, I've got a lot of room. The race regulations state that with a helmet on, you must have five centimeters of clearance from the roof to your head. Now I make that easily, but if it gets close, you can just pull the cushions. The suspension on these things are incredible and you're gonna lose almost two inches of height if you pull the cushions out. You can see already how much that did for me. Um, startup sequence is pretty easy. You just turn the main power switch on, turn the key on, then I'll find neutral. Just hit the start button. It's that easy. Now, I highly recommend Now I highly recommend if you're going to get a donor bike, ride the donor bike before you use it as an engine. Uh, the donor bike I got for this, I rode it on the street for a couple weeks before I pulled the motor and put it in here. And it did great on the street. It had a strong idle, had tons of power. The shifting was smooth. If you just buy an engine out of the back of a van and put it in here, you're potentially facing a lot more problems along with fabricating an entire cart. Um, sure, it's gonna cost a little more to get a full bike, but it's worth it. Pull the motor, pull the harness, and then sell the parts off the bike. Most of those bikes, you can sell the wheels alone as a set for like 800 bucks. So you're gonna get a lot of your money back and you're gonna have a lot more fun building an incredible machine. So, let's do a little start up and just a tiny drive, I guess. So as you can see, there is absolutely nothing, nothing like this. Uh, they're cross carts, they're not go-karts, and they're too small to be buggies, but you can take these anywhere. Now I call these VFs for variable frame. This one is currently set up. It's got about five or six inches of ride height. It's got six inches of shock travel. I can take this on the asphalt, I can take it in dirt, I can jump it. Uh, maybe not so much the dunes or trails, but that's what the other mode's for. I do multiple shock positions, and I have a second set of tires that are just for trail riding and off-road. Now, depending on where you wanna ride and what you want to do with your cart once you build it, depends on your engine choice. This does not have reverse, but I drive it like it doesn't have reverse and it's not an issue. Um, you're not gonna park with the nose into a tree and I'm probably not gonna ride this on the trails much, just like you wouldn't ride a crotch rocket on the trails. You're gonna ride an ATV or dirt bike on the trails. Most ATVs have reverse built into the transmission. So if trail riding is your number one thing, use an ATV as a donor. Um, if you want to go fast and drift or asphalt track, time attack, that kind of stuff, crotch rocket engine. This engine has just over 100 horsepower and it's got about 50 foot pounds of torque. Now it is a four cylinder. It revs up to 
12, 14,000 RPM, something like that. But the torque is very, very similar to a 500cc or 700cc ATV engine. So that punch is gonna be there no matter which way you go. But ATV engines redline around nine or 10,000 RPM. Uh, there's a, a huge misconception about how much power you need in one of these. 100 horsepower is ridiculous. ATVs boast that they have 50 horsepower, but if they redlined at 14,000 RPM, they would also have 100 horsepower because of how the math works out. Torque is what you want. Torque is what makes these things nuts. The horsepower of this, that big 14K redline, makes it incredibly fun to drift because you have all of that to play with. Instead of having to find a new gear, you can just rev it out in the gear you're in. So I hope I've answered a lot of questions and I hope that you guys get the chance to build and drive one of these. The building is amazing. The driving is amazing. Uh, the community we're building with these is amazing. So if I haven't answered all your questions, there is a Facebook group of all the guys that are actually building these. So you're not getting random comments for, from guys that just watch YouTube videos and try to correct everything that's going on. These are guys where you can see their build, you can see how they solve the problem instead of just seeing words that might sound good. Getting advice from guys actually building something is a million times better than getting advice from someone who's just looking at what you're building. Now, I built this about three years ago and I've officially pretty much driven it everywhere. I've driven it on trails, I've driven it in my yard, I've driven it on asphalt, uh, and it's held up extremely well. Now I do normal maintenance like I would for a crotch rocket or an ATV. I change the oil, uh, I grease the A-arms, I check the brakes. There, there's nothing being stressed, overly stressed from building this. Stay ahead of the bearings, just that kind of stuff. So I've been doing this for three years, and if you look on my channel, some of the videos are a bit dated, and I get on YouTube too, so I get that if you see a video that's three years old, it may not be relevant, but everything on my channel is relevant to building these. Uh, I did a very well-documented step-by-step build for building this one I'm sitting in, and then all the in-betweens of, of the whole operation. So. If you're interested in more of the details of anything here, it's on the channel. So check out the channel. I hope you learned something. Even if you're not building one of these, I hope it helps you with what you're doing. So thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, like and subscribe, please. And I'll see you guys next time. It's so fun. <laughs>